<clears throat> As we don't have a paper, I think we'll have to improvise, Roland, today. Let's do that. En français? Non. Okay. Merci, non. Bonjour à tous. Hola. Bonjour à tous. <laughs> yeah, so uh, this will be in English. I'm sorry, my French is a bit... Uh, this talk is about the value of octopologies in the era of the DIY frameworks. Oh, hold on, hold on. What so are those DIY frameworks? Yeah. DIY, bricolage. Yeah. So do it yourself. Uh, we are now a little bit used to Agile. It's been here for years already. And what we see as consultants that organizations are start to pick and you know cherry pick things from different frameworks and combine things. And there is frameworks targeted at, well, here you have a bunch of items and just try to make something nice. That's the do-it-yourself era. Yeah, and uh, you know, we are presenting you the topic of octopologies. We just finished a two-day class here in Paris. So it's a big topic, it's a vast topic. We barely were able to put it in today. So now we have less than an hour. And we always need to find a window through which to explain this topic. And this time the choice was obvious because we are at a flow conference. We decided to focus on the flow. So uh, speaking of flow. I need to give you a word of caution because what you are about to hear and see might be disturbing and cause unexpected side effects. Okay. So uh, we're talking about things that will be going a little bit against the flow or things that might be known to be normal and accepted maybe in your head, inside your team, your company or your industry. So you be warned, right? Yeah, and why is it so? Because as our mentor and coach, Craig Larman says, you cannot unsee a local optimization once you once saw it. So. Hopefully, in this talk, you'll be able to learn and see some local optimizations that when you go back to the offices tomorrow or next days, you will start seeing them and some different thoughts might be popping up in your, th in your mind. At least this is our hope for this talk. A few words about us so that you know our context and what we're good at. Yeah, well, these, are, these are the better versions of ourselves generated with AI. Um, my name is Roland Flem. This is Alexei Krivitsky. We have been sweating for about two years, more than two years, on the subject of organizational development. We call our project Org Topologies. And we span decades of knowledge uh, in both software development and uh, consultancy. We both are scrum trainers, but from different churches. So as we say, we go to different churches, we pray to the same gods of agility, adaptability. The right side of this picture, though, again, about the flow, right? We found ourselves swinging, swimming against the flow somehow. So we visited some talks in this conference, and of course, we know what happens in the industry by following a lot of people from you guys on LinkedIn. So we found ourselves that we are not really mainstream people. We're not trying to say popular things. We're not trying to say things that, you, that make you comfortable. Uh, not because we want to be special, uh, but because we believe the world is not black and white, right? And the mission of Orctopologies is to help all of us to create a bit more thoughtful organizations, right? And because this world is not black and white, of course, we would like to show you more options, right? We're not saying some options are better or worse than others. All depends on the context. So this is the map of octopologies, and we're not going to go into every box. Today, we'll be speaking out of the box, if I may say. Uh, but essentially, we will be talking about this multicolored panel of different options that you have, hopefully just to expand your understanding of what's possible in your organization. When we look at the box, the, the map that we have, it contains 16 boxes, and we can use them to map and plot and see ecosystems. So a combination of boxes together creates value. 
and the map in, is an invitation for you to try to see who is involved in creating value on a department or the whole organization and create these things that we call ecosystems. And once you see your ecosystem, you can talk about it and you can see what's, what is it doing for us and maybe also what kind of options you see to, well, redesign your ecosystem. Yeah, so we're trying to make invisible things slightly more visible so you can have wonderful, meaningful discussions about your organization and about the vector of development of your organization. Anyway, uh, let's get back to the flow. Yeah. Let's introduce Flowtech. This is an imaginary company and their vision statement is, we are creating a world of AI-powered IoT on blockchain, Internet of Things. Uh, Anybody yeah. works at Flowtech? No. Good, good, good. Now, there's a use case described. I'm going to read it for you so you understand what kind of challenges they have. They create worlds where your toaster strategizes your breakfast using AI. Your refrigerator trades energy credits on the blockchain to keep your greens fresh. And your coffee maker is cloud-powered to brew your coffee to perfection before you even wake up. Wow. Anyways, uh, of course, they have some challenges. And first, let's look what happens at the ground level of this company in the IT. Of course, IT is always somewhere ground or below the ground sometimes, right? Well, they're not in the basement. <laughs> well. <laughs> not this one. <laughs> these guys are not in the basement, right? They've been already uplifted, upgraded, elevated to a better state of being. And in the IT department, there is this guy called Florian, also known as Flo, right? And this guy is a head of engineering. And uh, over the past several years, he's been visiting different conferences, read all the books that you can find on this topic, and he has invested heavily in creating fast flow teams, like some of you, or maybe most of you and most of us has been doing, right? Uh, he read all these books, and he successfully practiced modern frameworks like Scum and Slave. And of course, he doffed into the new era of DIY frameworks like Unkicks and Team Apologies. So he really, you know, He's not kind, of, kind of, you know, explored the whole space and yeah. tried to take the best pieces out of it like most of us do because we are in the era of DIY frameworks, like somebody said before us, right? We don't believe in agile frameworks, etc. so we need to pick different things Etc. 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 He's not alone in the company. That's a good. Thing. No, we we have a second persona that we want to introduce. This is Florence. We thought we'd use a French name for the occasion, and she is a developer, and she works in a very specialized team working on I E I A M. That's um, identity access management, and they have distributed cloud-powered credential storage solutions. Wow. This team is also known as Forgotten Password Team. Okay, okay, well, that doesn't sound as sexy. Well, she's happy in her team, so she's got a lot to do. She's busy. Yes, and they follow the advice of yesterday keynote speaker and, and other speakers, Sander Hogan Dawn, right, was speaking yesterday, and of course, it's not a new thing that, well, you need to break the monolith into pieces and you need to speed up development. And her team was doing a wonderfully, right? That's the flow of the Forgotten Password team. They are the fastest team in the company. They can put things into production. And we actually, we might sound like sarcastic, but we are not. I mean, this is really important, right? To break things down. Like, as a developer, I've been doing this for many years and helping other companies do that. So it's right. It's not really a caricature. This is what really happens in the industry. A lot of people focus on these things, and these things are the right things to focus. Exactly, and especially if you look at what's happening in IT, then we can celebrate all kinds of successes with these strategies. I mean, in IT we see teams with happy people, and that's because management has put so much effort into reducing their cognitive load. And, and creating this private ownership. So it's very clear, you know, everybody knows their zone of accountability. There's clarity all over the place, and this creates teams, many teams that are really in a state of hyperflow. Not sarcastic, this is what people do. 
All right, so let's take the elevator and go up the boardroom and see what's That's happening cool. there. And currently in the boardroom, there is a meeting. All right, and somebody says, to go faster, last year, we doubled the number of teams from 30 to 65. Oh, but, uh, oh, I can't see it. <laughs> and our costs grew 300%. And our return on investment dropped with 25%, and CAPEX, OPEX, SHMAPEX, they all are down. What is happening what? here? <laughs> In other words, well, IT, IT is, is anyway. things up. Yeah, yeah. Who to blame? Always the IT, right? So, but yeah, there it is. Heads will roll. We need somebody to be accountable for this. Bring us the, the head, head of, of IT. IT. Yeah, we need him here. So now the Florian takes the elevator, interrupts his work, and needs to go to the upper floor to have some discussion. So please, in a minute, have a discussion. Turn to your neighbors, say hi, and you can speak in French or any other language. Have a discussion. What kind of a conversation do you think is happening in the boardroom when Florian enters that interesting uh, group of people? Have a discussion. A few minutes. E e yeah, right? Some people don't even have to talk. They've been through these discussions. They just know what happens there. Yeah. No matter what you discuss and realize, probably we can all agree on one thing, is that you know, these people, Florian and the board members, they speak kind of different languages, right? Well, what do board members say? Well, they talk about market share, profits, they see ROI, they have shareholders they need to report to. And he says, scum, slave, team apologies, going to float, all these things that he tried and he believes are working. Yeah, because he's not unwilling, but uh, listen, all the numbers are red, you know, ROI is going down, OPEX, whatever it was. And Florian says, you know, my measures, which I can collect, are actually green. It's team velocity, it's lead time, it's deployment frequencies, all the Dora metrics are green, so... Yeah. What's the problem? <laughs> there is a problem, though. Ladies and gentlemen, news. breaking news. Breaking news. Essentially, hire build a machine which allows you to do impossible. You can cook now everything in your home. This is the commercial they're broadcasting all over Europe. The Peking Duck experience. Put it in the oven in the morning, come back home at night, and you have the perfect Peking Duck. This is a real threat to Flowtech. Hire is taking the whole market with the I.O. home appliances. They can actually replace everything Flowtech has been building. So fix it. Yep. Fix the IT. All hands on deck. Now let's go out of the story and get a bit more serious, right? So Florian, he has been looking for these different things out there in the books, the conferences, uh, and he experienced, experimented with different things. And well, he wanted to solve problems they have. But then he realized over time, and especially after this discussion they had in a boardroom, actually I hope nobody flew out of the window during this discussion, is that solution they solve existing problems. And surprisingly, they can also create new ones. So every solution you're currently bringing to solve your known problems, eventually, in some kind of unpredictable manner, will create new problem, which hopefully is just a better problem to get solved. So he says, well, each team is very fast in its own bounded context. But essentially, none of the team can address the current challenge that we have. and. Well, if we need to replan and, and react to this threat that we have in the business, the whole roadmap of the R&D needs to be discarded and it will take forever because we just do it once a year when the budgeting cycle comes, right? So we need to be way faster than we are now. And he also said, says, you know, I thought my R&D was adaptive because, well, whenever I go, all these methods say, we're helping you to build adaptive, more adaptive, more adaptive system, but yes, they are maybe adaptive due to some extent, but in fact, we were just getting better at doing what we already know. So we could adapt when the strategy was stable, but now since the whole landscape changes, we realized, oh, 
adaptivity is expensive. The switching costs will be too high. Yeah, so there are, there are things that are happening now in the world that we were not prepared for, and that's a surprise. That's really a surprise. Good news. Is there any? I hope so. Oh. There is this conference you can go to, like Flocon. And that's what Florence and <laughs> Florian did. They took the train and they came to Paris. And, well, they were in the audience and they actually went to this great, uh, what's this called? Keynote at 2 o'clock. Yeah, so they went to this talk by Alexei and Roland, these two gentlemen. And in that talk at that conference, uh, Flo and Flo, Florian and Florence, they were introduced to this idea that, yes, flow optimization is important, right? So what you guys have been doing in a flow tech is great. You've been trying to complete the skills, add necessary skills, a cap capabilities, develop those teams, and it's a work every team member, every scrum master, every coach, every head of engineering should be proud of. Yeah, it's what we've been doing over the last years, getting you know ready with Agile. We were investing in creating these faster flowing teams. We were trying to make them more capable, better the definitions of done, faster. So we were closing their capability gap to try to let them be able to do everything. Another thing Flo and Flo learned at that talk, at that conference, right, is that this move, this horizontal move, this direction they've been investing on can also be called as a first agile wave. It's not the full agile, but it's important vector, it's important part, important component of agile, and some people call it the first way of agile. Well, assumedly, there is more well, than two, those people just call it one. Yeah. Uh, those gentlemen. But, of course, there's another gap up there, which those people call a value gap. And a value gap is a different thing, right? The value gap is different in how teams understand value and what they call products and what business stakeholders and customers outside of your building call value and call products. And what they were told at this talk is that well, if you create these teams which are super narrowly focused because you really want to make them fast, right? And the only way, essentially, to make teams really fast is to limit the number of things they are owning and accountable for. But then these people might think an iOS app of a bank is a product. A service that does something is a product uh -huh. that authentication component Florence has been working on exactly. is a product or a platform. But essentially, from the customer point of view, a banking app is not a product. It's just an interface to go to the depth of bank and talk to the backend banking system to see my transactions on my mobile screen. Right? So the, the vertical axis that we are proposing to introduce for I improving your company has to do with the scope of work. It's a, it's a product orientation, not just looking at how well is my team in doing things, how, what are their capabilities, but also how much do they know about the product that the customer is actually buying from us. And this is not exactly in the flow of other talks that we've heard before. Right, and the true organizational, or if you may, business agility, or whatever we might call it in our industry that is happening now, and that will even become even more and more happening because of AI and other companies that are trying that, will help to create this high level of organization that master both, not just the capabilities and flow in the teams, but also help the teams and developers to have a broader understanding of the value and the customer ideally close to the value and product definition the customers have. Yeah, so that's, that's what we would call second wave uh, of the Agile movement, to include that product knowledge, to include that, to start closing that value gap. Now, they, maybe it was a bit too philosophical and there were too many words and too many uh, hard pictures to understand. So we would like you to bring this back home. And again, this time, please talk to somebody, right? You might actually want to <coughs> sit closer to somebody and have a four-minute discussion. 
Well, if your organization would decide to go, you know, uh, what will it mean for the organization to be bridging both of the gaps? Okay, so please have a discussion. What will it mean in your organization if you decide to try to close those, those two gaps? And if you didn't understand what the, those gaps are, ask the other person, maybe she understands. Have a discussion about that, please. All right, thank you. It's good to hear people chatting uh, at the conference. Thank you for doing that. We have to do that. it in French. On yeah. reprend, mesdames et messieurs. They told me to say that, I don't know. Well, Roland parle bien français. Ouais, toi aussi, hein. Okay. Okay, so uh, maybe it was confusing, right? Maybe it was not clear, because that move up is not really, really known in the industry, I think. Well, Everybody's it... talking about flow, right? Not so many people about talking, yeah, maybe, maybe something else is also important. We're not saying flow is not important. Flow is super important, but is it the only component? We know at least two, maybe there are five, 10, 100 different other components which we should be thinking of. And if we know many components, which one is your primary component to optimize for and which one to sacrifice or vice versa. So Flo also had a lot of these ideas in his head now. Hmm. Maybe we've been focusing too much on the team level flow. Spend a lot of money on it. Well, and actually I never considered the product I mentioned. What would that look like? My current teams, it's not difficult. And uh, does this mean that all the teams will really collaborate intensively on the same product strategy? That's like big, wow, difficult. Hmm. And of course, other thoughts happening in her hand, in her head, like, well, all teams working as a one team of team. How does that supposed to work, right? Will it mean that we have to share the same bigger context, not divided, but actually share broader space of work? Hmm, she thinks, that might actually sound interesting, she says. But then we will have to discard our team's individual backlog and a roadmap and the discovery work we've done for our authentication, forgotten password team work. And then how about the other teams, the search team, the catalog team, the checkout team, the reporting team, the washing team, do they all have to just stop doing what they're doing? Just join forces and do other things? What happens to the product owners, backlogs, all this investment? Teams working as one big team? Well, you know, I don't think so. It's not efficient. It's not gonna work. And what about co-ownership? If you all own a certain responsibility, then nobody has that responsibility. We all know that, right? This is not going to work. Cognitive overload! I mean, how can you know everything of a product? Heads will explode. And I will be responsible, okay? Not on my watch. Teams will be busy learning. Learning doesn't bring us any money, right? It will kill the flow. It's not going to happen. Right remarks, right? This stuff should happen in people's head because these things are dilemmas, right? They don't really have single answer. And other things happening in her head is like, she's, she's thinking, hey, I used to work in a startup when we programmed five different systems in three different languages, and we actually work as one big team, <laughs> she thinks, and then, and so we also talk to the customers ourselves. Well, and everything we worked on was relevant. Right? If you're talking to the customer on a daily basis and you're owning everything that is happening there, like if you are in a startup, then everything you're working on is relevant. Your team is always relevant. But she thinks, hmm, I wonder if that can actually be applied to corporations like Flowtech. They're not startups. Yada, yada, yada. Many other thoughts and dilemmas happening in the head, right? Okay, um, we started with this quote, right, from Greg Lorman, you cannot unsee local optimization. Once you see it, it will always stay with you, with, with you, right? So let's, deep, let's go deeper a little bit into this systems thinking applied to org design concept, dive a bit more into this. 
from the system's thinking point of view, right, if you're optimizing the individual parts of the system, you are guaranteed not to get optimized system as a whole. That's like... It's a law. It's almost a law. Yeah. It's been discovered in the 70s when system thinking was really hard, invented, studied, proved at different universities. Again, if you're trying to optimize individual parts, you're guaranteed only by luck, only by chance, the whole system improves. We all understand that. And the more parts there are, the more connection there are, the less chances that there are this will happen. So to make this a little less abstract, the system that's, let's call it, that's the organization that is trying to produce value. And the parts in this system are the teams. So if you keep on pushing a lot of energy in optimizing single teams, then the chances are, well, they're not chances, then you know for sure that your whole organization will slow down ultimately. And we see this happening. That's systems thinking. Everybody who studied, learned Wikipedia systems thinking, they know this thing. But there is one counterintuitive aspect to this, right? So in order to optimize the whole, we actually need to sub-optimize the parts. Like, it's either that or that. So if we're caring about the whole, parts will suffer. They have to suffer and they have to ac accept that suffering for the benefits of greater good. If we value adaptability as our organizational optimizing goal, well, then maybe some teams will not be at the fastest flow possible because from time to time they will have to switch context to stay relevant and learn something they've never worked with before. And this actually goes very much against a lot of things that we hear at this conference and other conferences and what is said in many, many books these days. A lot of focus on team level improvements, not so much focus on global things just because it's easier to improve at a local level and measure and be happy, uh, etc. So it's hard to optimize the whole. To make it a bit more concrete, right? local optimizations versus global optimizations. Like every time somebody says to you, oh, it's not efficient, you should ask, well, what do you mean? Like locally or globally? You know, efficiency can be local or it can be global, right? Maybe it's not efficient for this team to stop working on what they're working on and learn. It's not efficient for the team, but it, uh, more efficient for the global organization, for a global system, for a department, for a bunch of teams because that upper system, bigger system is learning. Is it also short term or long term, right? Every time somebody's mentioning the word efficiency, you should have this sound in your head. Because huh, what do you mean? Small, big, local, global, right? And then if you clarify what they mean, maybe you trying to optimize globally and this person is really much motivated to keep optimizing things locally. And that's why you have this constant conflict in the company between product managers and heads of engineering. Business stakeholders, scrum masters, whatever that may be, they think about efficiency just differently. Another example can be, oh, this is a fast flow team. Fantastic, great. But at which cost at the global level? You cannot be locally fast without any side effects. Right? If I'm playing in a band and I'm a very lousy bass player, if I play a bit faster than the rest of the band, that's probably the last gig I'm it's gonna called have. It's called jazz. With, it's called jazz, right? Yeah, sometimes. Which undesired side effects it will create in the oral, oral, oral organization in the long run? Maybe positive, fantastic, something unexpected, maybe not, but it makes sense to think about this. We hear this word fast and flow and efficiency. What exactly do we mean by this and how we measure it? Private code ownership reduces cognitive load. Duh. If I own just one line of code Yay. in the company, I'm the fastest developer ever. So there's some limit to this, right? Well, you guys know more about this with domain-driven design. Of course, it's not just one line of code. It's some kind of context, yada, yada, yada. But this is the thinking, right? At which cost? And how will it impede organizational learning and long run if we divide and conquer, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera.
Yeah, so that's introduction to trying to think more systemically and deeper and not just go for the easy solution because systemic means there's a lot of stuff involved and it's complex and you need to do some slow thinking to really understand what's happening. Now, uh, we think it's time for discussion after this. And we promise that's the last time we're asking you to do something yeah. unpleasant at our keynote. Uncomfortable talking yeah. to your neighbor. So, again, talk to your neighbor or talk to your imaginary friend. And I see a lot of people are talking to somebody inside. That's all right. Think of some examples of those local optimizations that you observe, have observed, might be observing in your organization. So which means what we're optimizing locally without paying attention to which effects it might have on the global picture. And by global, here we don't really mean world ecology bucket, we mean business. Okay? So like for the, for the company and for the business and for the customers. Well, a small example. Uh, my team that I'm working with, work, I'm a product owner and I have a team and I make sure they get a lot of work, but it's the forgotten password team and actually, well, my team is very busy, so locally we're very well optimized because resource optimization is at 100%, but from a global perspective, my team doesn't really deliver any value to the customer because they think the forgotten password routines work fine, okay? That's an example of, not well, it's locally optimized, but globally not giving any value. Now, please do talk to your neighbor and see if you can identify. And before you start, don't blame people. There's no blaming in systems thinking. If somebody is optimizing locally, it's not because these people are stupid, evil, dumb, whatever. Maybe they are. But it's not a, because, the, the, because of that, they are locally optimizing. They're optimizing locally because there are some motivations in the company to think like that. So don't blame people, just try to observe some systemic behaviors that are happening. A few minutes, please, do talk to your friends. Okay, uh, it's great energy. Thanks a lot. Now you know what to discuss over the bigger break which is coming, right? More examples of local optimization. Anybody there sharing briefly one a, thing? Like a very good one, very good local optimization. Anybody there sharing without the name of a company, no. of course? No. 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 Anybody wants to share one? No. Oh. Fun? I will Fun? share one then. Yeah. Okay. How about making sure that all deck chairs are perfectly organized on the Titanic? Hmm? Or somebody in a restaurant chopping onions, and there are a lot of onions chopped, and everybody is crying, but you don't need so many onions. No. These are me metaphors for local optimization. Of course, you found something more specific, right, which makes sense only in your context. It's important to bring back this language of local optimization versus global optimization, long term, short term, to your company, and start kind of questioning in a good way intentions of other people. Right, so we believe it's, it's important as never before to start thinking systemically. Uh, we have 15 minutes, so it's uh, time for questions. Anybody? I have a question. Sorry, I love asking questions. And now that I have the opportunity to be on stage, I can might as well abuse it to okay. ask questions. You go, you go first, <laughs> Roland. Here's a question. So what is the question, uh, sir? I'm going to make sure that this is a question everybody wants to know. Um, so moving up, you know, towards that product dimension and making people know more uh, and be fast. Does that really work in real companies? Or is it just an abstract concept that you guys bring here to stage? Are there any examples of those companies? Hmm? And how do they do it? Well, good questions. Robert. Yes, thank you. You've, you've yeah. come well prepared, I have to say. Thank you. Yes. So I guess a lot of you share this, right? And we also asking this question ourselves. So we are doing a kind of a research of our lifetime, trying to find these organizations and go inside and talk to them, talk to managers, product managers, executive developers, the main people, developers, and understand like, so how does that company work? We'll give you several examples of such companies. You can find them on LinkedIn and actually approach them and talk to them. One of them is really not known and none of them are actually known. None of them are like Apple, Google, etc. This company is based in Ukraine and is the largest producer of B2B restaurant automation software. 
So if you go to the restaurant in Ukraine and you've been served there, and everybody welcome to go to Ukraine, to my hometown, Kiev, after the war, please do this, visit us. Um, then you'll be probably served in a restaurant with their software. So few pictures here, few snapshots of org design that in org topologies language we call org design scans. It's like you're flying around the company and what you see. And this part uh, where Roland stays, that's what was before 2022. They had like nine islands, nine small islands. And by colors, we mean different classification based on org topologies, but they were low-level archetypes, meaning every company, you know, this, you see these dotted lines around the teams, that's the context they were owning. Every team was owning same, same small context. Some people were owning components, like a payment component. Because you're doing restaurant automation, there are different printers in restaurants to print checks and all that. There, would, there was a printer driver team in the company, right? And some teams were building a bit more understandable by the customer's features. Some teams were building um, constructor so the restaurant can build a website with a menu for itself, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But every team has its own list. I would not even call it a backlog. A list of things to do, a list owner, product owner, and a team lead, right? It's a very classical setup you see in a lot of organizations. And after about uh, nine months of systems thinking and talking about the problems they have and trying to understand what they want to be when they grow up, they realized, okay, we can actually try to learn how to work together again like we had worked when we were small. Let's go back to this idea of we are a team of teams, right? And essentially, they, um, you know, on that part, you have nine teams. Here you have six teams. It doesn't mean they fired people or people quit. No, they reshuffle teams. They let people self-organized in their new teams. And they, would, and they made sure these new teams had knowledge of different components. Like if there was a team who knew printers well, they make sure those five guys go into different teams so that five teams, at least out of six, could do something with uh, printers. So this was the idea, like open up, right? Some key concept they did. It was a smallish company, 50 people in R&D. They formed the total of six, not only cross-functional, it's important. Scrum talks about cross-functional scum, uh, but they also cross-component teams. That's a very big difference if you want to go up on the vertical axis. And teams were detached from the architecture. The opposite advice that we've heard many times at this conference. You detach teams from the architecture, and now all these teams together co-owning that architecture, which sounds like a very bad idea. But if you do it carefully, right, if you do it thoughtfully, if you put some thinking, coaching, communities, uh, that actually worked pretty well. And when team pulled an item from the backlog, they might pull an item which required work in a component they have never worked before. They can give it back to other team who had more knowledge, or they can say, okay, that's interesting. It's the first time in our lifetime we're gonna open up this repository. And when they open up a repository, what happened within the first half a year in, in this company, the developers were like, oh, that's interesting. This repository had been owned by the team, which doesn't exist anymore. But we see the team used this special technology for deployment or whatever, database, scripting, migration. But other repositories that we know already, they do something different. What do we do? Let's standardize. Let's simplify. Let's change this repository so it behaves like other repositories. So the level of complexity of the architecture goes down when you do this. And when things become more obvious and transparent and visible, owning and co-owning becomes even easier and even better. So this vertical move, sometimes we call descaling or simplification because we're trying to simplify and get rid of things that are really bothering, okay? Uh, and there are videos, of course, you can find online about this company, another example, of a slightly bigger company. Pandadoc. Um, as you can see, it's a more complex organization, and this is the ultimate result that they've uh, achieved. But what they did actually is create three big 
groups of teams, and you could say that that's their bounded context they work in, and in that context, all the teams try to share as much information as they can, as they can. again with the same effects of emergent architecture, emergent standards, and you name it. So uh, they, they teach each other across these teams about learning about new stuff that they haven't done before. Um, and it's not like a, a journey that happens overnight. The story that you just told and this story for PandaDoc, it takes years and years and years to do this. And it's done with small experiments that fail and then we retry again. So don't think this is magic happens overnight. This is a journey. And a tool like Org Topologies can help you to travel that journey in a, in a sensible way and keep your point north where it is. Yeah, and this team, this company, they didn't use Org Topologies. They use actually ideas from large scale Scrum less uh, to arrive to this Org design over five years of experiments. One uh, particular um, item on this list I would like to comment on last one, component mentorship and communities. Oh, yeah. This company had a lot of code, a lot of Components. This is like a document management system, uh, digital signatures, etc. Complex domain, and of course, over the course of years, the company is like more than 10 years old. They had a lot of legacy code. Like we all have. So, how do you open up this code now to everybody? Well, you don't do this overnight, right? What you do, you look at your components, maybe equal to repositories, right? And you try to classify them. Ha, huh, okay, this component is in a good shape. It has a decent code coverage, uh, test coverage. Uh, it already has automation, deployment, pipeline. So, and it's not a critical, it's not a mission cr critical component. So we can give it away to all the teams. And if somebody breaks something, well, these are CI running and stuff, right? And maybe there are five more components like this that we can give away to everybody on the first day. So private code ownership, and shared code ownership are not just two options. There are many steps in between, right? Some things you can open and give away. Some things you're like, hmm, no, this is very core part of our product. Only one team knows it. And now you have an option. So we are giving you options, right? One option is let them own it forever. Let call them, what's, what do they call them in team topologies? Complex subsystem team. If you have a complex subsystem, you have a complex subsystem team. If you have a complex subsystem team, you have a complex subsystem. It's like they are married forever. Unless the mission of this team is to refactor, improve at tests, and at some point, give it away to other teams. So this component mentorship community is the idea where you identify those difficult components, and you have a roadmap for each component. Like maybe you attach a team to it to work on it, or maybe you pull people from different teams, or maybe, maybe people of a volunteer come from different teams, which is even cooler, and work as a temporary team to improve code. And then they go back to their teams, but now those teams have knowledge about these components. So you can do it gradually, right? You don't need to decide public code ownership or shared, no. So transformation in reality is messy. And it looks always great afterwards on conferences like these to show mappings, and it was all brilliant and nice and clean, but reality is, of course, messy. One last one, maybe? Yeah, Let's one last one, and before we go to the last one, which is super interesting, this one, you see these three kind of circles equal to departments. Well, at uh, who will study org topologies and the map, you will see two upper levels, B level and C level. So this is the difference. At a B level organization, those walls between departments, they will be fixed. I'm in the team X and I'm in this department. I work on a B to B to B to C. You are in some other team with other teams to, to, together and you are working on B to B to B to B to B to C and we never change. And you have your fixed manager, etc. This will be a B-level company. The C-level company, which is a more fluid way, and this is what PandaDoc is doing. Teams stay midterm midterm, not forever, midterm, attached to some big business objectives which require them to work on B2B to B2C. But when that objective is done, or what the team did, would like to learn something else, or maybe that area grows and this area shrinks because business develops like this, this team will go 
and become a part of their department. So departments are not really departments. They're just areas of agreements and they are fluid. So this is a very different uh, way of designing your organization. And the last example that we can discuss yeah. is Wysoft. Wysoft, very, very interesting, revolutionary company. And again, we show one image, but there were multiple stages and you can find more details on our website on how they progressed. It's a large case study. Um, uh, Wysoft had 14 teams, so it's a little bit smaller than the previous one. Um, but the funny thing is they, or the, the good thing is they achieved to serve all the teams or work, let all the teams work in one same bounded context. So one sprint, if you want it, that all the teams share. There's one, one space for collaboration. And a couple of years ago, I don't know the exact year, was it 2022? Maybe they, they went manager less. So they, they've observed in earlier stages that actually having middle management was cause, stopping them from growing further into becoming the cell, the one big cell organism that they are now. And they've decided to repurpose management. So there's job security, but not role security. And you can maybe do something else that's more valuable than managing things in our company. Some people did and some people left. I think there's an example of somebody who was happy to start coding again, you know? Yeah. You want to say something? Go. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. I say, yeah, back Yay, to coding, okay. <laughs> back to coding. Yeah. So the, there's one product owner for the whole company, the CEO, okay? And he has two helpers, two people, two product managers that do more daily kind of work with the teams. CEO sets, tra sets strategy and puts bigger items on the, on, the, on the roadmap, which is called a product backlog. Um, there was a point in time where they did a merger, so they took over a new company, and the people of that new company needed to learn all the software that Wisoft is making. And uh, it was pretty fast, actually, because it took the five teams one month to, be, to get up to speed in the new code base. Sharing code makes stuff simpler, because if I know that you're going to read my code, I will think twice about you know, what I'm writing. Yeah, so, and these are not fairy tales. These are Googleable uh, talks, conferences, articles. You can all find them. So we are in a, in a research of finding more companies like this. And if you're experiencing something similar in your company, please do find us, talk to us. We'd love to talk with you and learn more from you, right? And the idea of these companies, they are much more adaptive and resilient than any other company we know. The company in Ukraine, which we studied uh, our examples with, is still there, um, kicking the market even during the war, even after COVID. So those companies, not just funky, not just sharing code and learning, those companies have those things that we listed, they have really significant business implications like resilience, for example. Yeah. Because in the example of um, Flowtech, if they need to address a new problem, all teams can work on anything they're used to learning. So it's a matter of putting new items on the product backlog for them to start working on it. So you don't need a reorganization if you really want to change direction as a company. Right. We are not really trying to rewrite Agile Manifesto. We think we just need to help people read their, that one a bit better than they are. But we've come up with these five principles that we've observed organizations that create business-oriented R&D follow. And I'd like to, to give you a minute, just make pictures and uh, read them for yourselves. Yeah, similar to what conference has on the front page, right? This, yeah, but a bit different. The, just a quick comment on the item number four, from constant reorganization to adaptive org design. What's interesting in those companies is that when something changes on the market and they need to readjust the company strategy, like hire introduces new crazy thing on the market, those companies don't need to reorganize themselves. They don't need to create new teams and new business units and new backlogs and hire new product owners and do all this mess. They can just realign the order, the items on their backlog, if you will, or whatever technique they use to manage business priorities. And because the teams got used to learning 
and working on new things from time to time, the teams will start to learn these new things. We now have two minutes and we're really welcoming now your questions if you have them for us. Thank you so much. Don't applause yet, don't applause yet. If you applause twice, it always goes awkward, so wait with that. Uh, we have a hand in the middle, lady in a blue. Yeah, thanks. I think we'll have time for only one question. And there is just a coffee break afterwards? Yes, there's a coffee break afterwards. Here? Okay. And where you will be discussing more local optimizations, right? And while the uh, artificial intelligence uh, created coffee is coming... <laughs> Yeah. Uh, first of all, thanks a lot. It was absolutely amazing presentation, very full of humor and creative and dynamic. Thank you very much. Now, just a couple of words to uh, Alexei. Я очень рада тебя видеть в Париже. Мы пересекались в Киеве. Очень рада тебя здесь видеть. I'm also Ukrainian. Okay. Ne parle russe maintenant. Subtitles, please. Now, <laughs> subtitles. Yes. And now uh, let's um, go straight forward to the question. Uh, it would be curious to know um, what uh, served you as an inspiration for your org topologies. I guess that uh, systemic thinking for sure, and what else? It's hard to say it better than what Craig Larman says. And yeah. we are trying to find our own. Thank you for, for the question, and good to see you too. Larman says, I'm trying to reduce suffering in product development. That's what he says. We are a bit more optimistic. We would like to improve the lives of people in organizations, but not just by locking them and giving them one line of code to own, by opening up this locked human potential. It's not just about making happy people. You can just give them drugs, right? For God's sake, I did drugs, so I, you can be happy for a few minutes. It's okay, but it's not about being happy. It's about realizing the lock potential in the organizations, which eventually will make people more fulfilled. So we are seeing a lot of companies, and a lot of companies are dysfunctional because every group of people is dysfunctional, so it's okay. But some companies really push, put people down, you know, like, in the, like on our picture, like on the ground or on the first level. And we believe human beings are human beings, and they just can work on things they would like to work on, they can be more creative, they can be, they should be free from these limitations of somebody believes cognitive load will explode my head. I haven't seen a developer with like open head exploded. They learn, they suffer, but eventually they think it was the right thing to do. So I would say human potential. Okay. To be more concrete, I think um, I was really inspired when I saw Scrum and did my first Scrum teams as Scrum, Scrum Master. Scrum. Ah, Scrum. And um, uh, later I discovered large-scale Scrum with Buzz Vode and Craig Larman. That was very inspirational to take it a step further. Um, I also saw the decline in the enthusiasm of people doing Scrum and Agile. And I'm really, you know, it hurts me. And I want to make sure that that changes. We all see that we just have to apply it differently. It's my calling in life. Anybody else has a question for us? I guess, unfortunately, I'm afraid we won't have okay. any time. Um, All right. But oh. if you guys are here... Uh, now you can applause if you want. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much for having us. <laughs>